Hello folks, now it's time for precept number five. This is the one that always gets me into trouble and people always get upset when I talk about this one. It's the precept that says don't get high. If you look at the Chinese characters used to express the precept, there are four of them. They should be on the screen below. And the first one is not un, it's, it's hu. It comes up in fu, fu, shi, fu shiryo and hi shiryo. If you are interested in that, uh, think the thought of not thinking. It's different from thinking. The first one is fu shiryo and the next one is hi, hi shiryo. And shiryo, shiryo means consideration or thinking. Anyway, the first one is fu, which means not, don't. Uh, the second one uh, means buy or sell. The third one is uh, if you've traveled around in, uh, in Asia at all or you go to your local Chinatown or Japantown or whatever you happen to have in your town, uh, you'll see this one a lot. It means uh, liquor, wine, beer, sake, uh, alcohol basically and uh, it shows up a lot in, in signage so if you ever see this character you know where to get your booze. And the fourth one is just a uh, precept. So, Specifically, this precept is about not selling wine, and uh, wine or liquor intoxicants. And I'll read you what Nishijima Roshi said about it, because I think it says what I want to say anyway. Uh, don't live by selling liquor. That's how he gives the precept. This seems rather strange as a religious precept. I feel that the original concept might have been not to drink liquor. Perhaps as Buddhism spread from India to countries like China and Japan, this precept was altered to suit local conditions. In those northern countries, alcohol was considered an important aid to survival during the cold winter months. So personally, I feel that it is important not to drink, but we should recognize the precept in the form that has come to us from the past. So he gave the precept the way it came to us from the past. Uh, he himself didn't drink alcohol or do any drugs and so he followed the original version of the precept but when he gave the precept he gave it as don't live by selling liquor. Uh, here is the Brahmajala Sutra version of it. That's that 5th century Chinese one that seeks to explain the, uh, the precepts. Yeah. Uh, it says, a disciple of the Buddha must not trade in alcoholic beverages or encourage others to do so. He should not create the causes, conditions, methods, or karma of selling any intoxicant whatsoever, for intoxicants are the causes and conditions of all kinds of offenses. As a Buddha's disciple, he ought to help all sentient beings achieve clear wisdom. If instead he causes them to have an upside-down, topsy-turvy way of thinking, he commits a major offense. And as, uh, as I always have been doing this evolution, of the precepts study guide from the 2008 Soto Zen Buddhist Association conference gives us a bunch of different ones used in various mostly American Zen centers so let's look at a few of these uh, Griffith Folk fifth precept not to deal in alcoholic beverages so that's just a straight translation uh, here we go boundless way Zen Center says cultivating a mind that sees clearly I vow to take up the way of not giving or taking drugs Wanderling, I'm not sure who that is, uh, says there's no trafficking in delusion. Uh, Nonin's version of the, of the precept is, a follower of the way does not intoxicate self or others, but rather cultivates and encourages clarity. Great Vows and Monastery says, I vow not to misuse drugs or alcohol, but to keep the mind clear. Uh, Akiyama Roshi has abstinence from taking harmful intoxicants. Let's find a longer one. Okay, here's Philip Kaplow. Not to cause others to use liquor or drugs that confuse or weaken the mind and do not do so oneself but keep the mind clear. Uh, Appleton Zen Center has another long one. I act at all times with mindfulness and clarity. I do not abuse my body or cloud my mind with the misuse of intoxicants. Uh, let's see. Uh, Diane Eshin Rosetto has, I take up the way of cultivating a clear mind. Fear holds the cup, and I hide in the distortion of its shadow. The cup falls, and sunlight blinds with powerful brightness. I vow to stand with empty hands, tight chest, trembling in tears. I vow to stand with eyes open to what is revealed. Who drops the cup? It's a little bit of poetry there in that one. Uh, but, um, not entirely clear what that means but that's fine but if we want to get even more kind of confusing with it let's see what Dogen says Dogen's commentary on the precept says not selling fermented liquor where nothing can be 
brought in, that is where everything is inviolable. Uh, this is exactly the great brightness. Okay, that's a good one. And as I've been doing, let's see what Kobenchino Roshi has to say on this precept. He gives first the Bodhidharma's One Mind Precept version of the precepts, which is, Self-nature is mysteriously profound. Truth of original basic purity. Not to give birth of ignorance is called no selling wine, no drinking wine. Okay, so that one's getting a little bit more philosophical there with the precept. And let's read what he has to say, a couple of paragraphs of it. We try not to intoxicate our body and mind because if we go along with the heavy trip of intoxication, a very powerful life or chemical takes over our life. We don't know what was eaten, what was taken, or what was given. The unity of energy with other existences is very delicate, and if we are intoxicated, we lose the opportunity to unite with them. In a sense, nothing is wrong to do. Right and wrong are just our way of perceiving things and evaluating how human life can be, either in good shape or very dangerous shape. Our body decides what to do about bodily intoxication, but our mind is open to enormous amounts of teaching of many kinds. Those teachings work powerfully with the mind, so to delude the true nature is what we call intoxication. Hopefully we will observe our whole life with Buddha's body and mind and live through this life without much delusion. Once we give our lives to delusion, we lose contact with many important things and people. Keep your mind clear and let it penetrate through those things and people and situations. That's why the precepts are offered. They're not just to prohibit you from doing one thing or another, but to keep your true nature functioning at its best. And then a little bit further down he says, There are many stories about uncontrolled, helpless situations caused by the powerful effects of intoxication on our delicate bodies and minds. You drink strong wine and step on an insect, unaware. In the next life you will be born as that insect and then you will be stepped on by a drunken man. If you wish to control or conduct yourself well, the only way is by inner recognition of yourself. At first, curiosity about intoxication and the relatively gentle effect of intoxication washes over you. If it becomes a habit, you don't know whether it is you intoxicating the wine or the wine intoxicating you. It becomes a continuous, ongoing relationship. Using heavy liquor is like eating a lot of sugar, continuously causing you to be sick. Eating rich food all the time makes you diabetic. Strong wine or whiskey makes your brain fogged and doesn't let your brain recover. Smoking is the same. There is also a powerful mind reaction to marijuana. I had one terrible experience. I thought I could sit zazen after drinking quite a lot of sake, and it was terrible. The body is like a boneless creature if you drink too much. You cannot even walk straight. If you have no control over intoxication, it is best to give it a vacation. Refrain from that state for two or three days and see how the body feels. It is important to develop your experience of the cleansing sensation. So that's kind of interesting, and I've been on and on about this topic several times here because there, there are people out there in the, you know, the world who look at the precept the way it's originally given in Chinese characters and notice that one of the Chinese characters is specific for alcohol and then they go, well, it's just prohibiting alcohol. That means I can take LSD and peyote and marijuana and DMT and ecstasy and whatever else uh, and have a spiritual experience. Well, those kind of spiritual experiences are nonsense. There may be certain times when you can gain a bit of insight while on drugs. I won't deny that. But those insights are, are very... I always imagine it like uh, when they say like uh, if, if somebody's trying to get pregnant, uh, the egg sometimes doesn't hook onto the, the wall of the uterus and, and isn't viable and then doesn't, uh, doesn't grow into a baby. I feel like the insights that you have on drugs are like that. They, they, can't, they don't have anything to, to cling on to because they're so scattered. So you might have an insight, but it, it has nowhere to go and it, and it can't really help you except you know, maybe for a couple of seconds or, or maybe as a kind of slap in the face that things are different from what you thought they were. Other than that, there's nothing there. And the people who, who advocate drugs as Buddhist practice really annoy me because I think that is incredibly, incredibly irresponsible. And, uh, and I've talked enough about that for, for a lifetime. The other idea here in the Bodhidharma One Mind Precepts version is not to give birth to ignorance. Now that, if you kind of take it on its word, 
that gets into some really basic stuff if you're a Buddhist, because we look at ignorance as one of the, the foundational aspects of why we are here in the first place, why this world exists at all, is based on primordial ignorance. And so this precept is asking you to do something even more impossible than, than the other precepts were, which is not to give rise to ignorance. And, and because you have given rise to ignorance in the, well, I won't even say in the past, but in the, in the more basic sense of, of what you are in coming into existence. If you remember, I gave that uh, talk about the 12-fold chain of, of uh, codependent co-origination, and I believe number one is ignorance. Is it number one? Anyway, it's number one or two. <laughs> I, so I'm so ignorant I don't remember. But it's very, very foundational in the Buddhist understanding of how the world even comes into existence. So it's asking you not to have ignorance. Is It's asking you to have a clear view of things. And the only way you're going to have a clear view of things is to avoid intoxication. I mean, you'll have enough trouble doing it without being intoxicated. And if you become intoxicated, you become heedless and you, and you become reckless. And, and even though the feeling can come over you that, that, oh, look, I've gained great insight. Well, watch what your actual behavior is during that time that you gained great insight. This I'm telling you because that's what I've done myself. I have felt at times while intoxicated on various substances that I've done in my past that I've gained incredible insight. But if I actually stop and look at my behavior during those times, I am not acting like an insightful person. I'm doing all the wrong things and being reckless and stupid and taking chances that I shouldn't take and all sorts of things, getting myself into trouble. This is why the Buddhist precepts forbid intoxication. They say, don't get high. That's the best way, that the, the, the strongest way I know of to put it. And it's because of the heedlessness of it and because it's so much more difficult to understand the truth if you are intoxicated than it already is when you're not intoxicated because we're all suffering from a kind of primordial intoxication. That's why we got here. That's what ignorance is. It's a kind of basic intoxication and a basic misunderstanding of ourselves and the world we live in. And the only way we're going to unravel that is in a sober state when we're at least a little bit closer to being able to see things clearly. So that is the fifth precept, and I have spoken, and let's watch the commenters rage about how oh, I had a peyote experience that taught me the world was flat or whatever the hell they're going to say, you know, and let the Buddhist geeks c complain about it and, and all the other people. I don't care. But what I do care about is getting donations from you, uh, and they will not be spent on drugs or intoxicants of any kind. Here is the address that you can send them to. If you are looking at YouTube, you will see direct links to my PayPal and Patreon links below the screen in the, in the uh, whatever it's called section right below everything. Uh, that is how I make my living. That is how I keep buying things that don't intoxicate me but keep me from starving. I really appreciate your donations if you are having financial trouble do not donate to me because I don't want donations from people who are having difficulty but those of you who are donating thank you very much I really appreciate it have a good time all the time bye